Right, folks, we're going to make a start. Um, <laughs> Richard, if you could mute everybody, first of all, that'd be good. Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome, everybody who's watching on YouTube uh, down the weeks. It's a real blessing to have you with us. Um, we've got a few of our friends who've uh, just uh, let us know where they are this morning. John and Val. Val's having her first vaccination in Louth as we speak. Um, Paul and Katie, although Katie will be um, on during the service, they are virtually in Devon. Uh, I think listening to a service from Devon and Pam and Dave send their apologies as well, but it's really good to have everybody with us. Um, if you're new here, it's good to see uh, Ben and Caroline with us. Just to let you know, Ben and Caroline and anybody else during the service, if you want to, we're going to have communion. Um, so if you want to get some bread and wine, that's fine. If not, don't worry about it. But we will be having communion uh, during the service. So that's good. I think we've got a, a really exciting service uh, this morning. And uh, I always get excited and in some anticipation for Sunday morning. So what I'm going to do is just pray and inter introduce the meeting, and then we're going to move straight on. So, Jesus, thank you that we can gather together in your wonderful name. There is no other name, no other person than you. You're greater than it all. And we say to you, uh, be blessed as we worship you. Enjoy our time with you as we want to enjoy our time with you, Lord. So let your spirit move amongst us in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you remember I've been challenging or just encouraging, challenging is too strong a word. I've been encouraging us all. Um, I think, again, it started with John and Val to for, for us to have a, a, a minute testimony. And I received a lovely one this morning uh, during this week, which we're going to hear this morning, and it's from John Cordell. It's going to—it's a really good way of just introducing us into our our first song and our, our, our extended time of worship. And uh, I'm going to hand over to Richard. It's John encouraging us that the Christian faith is full of hope. Some years ago, I was driving on the Foldingworth Bends when a large lorry came towards me on the wrong side of the road and on two wheels. I thought my time was up, but remarkably, the lorry righted itself at the last possible moment. I have reflected on that heart-stopping moment many times. I have come to the conclusion that it was God's plan, and I am moved to share my beliefs with you. There is much negativity and depression around. I believe we should challenge this and re reject it. Christianity is a positive and optimistic religion. Indeed, we believe in the second coming. Let us look at powerful words in the Bible. For example, Psalms chapter 30, verse 5. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Or well, the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. So Lord, guide us to promote the positive Christian message and challenge and reject negativity and pessimism. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, John. That's a wonderful way for us just to come into um, our time together to worship him. We have a wonderful hope in Jesus Christ. Now what we're going to do now, we're going to start off with the song we've been looking and we are looking at John's Gospel at this time. So if you've got a Bible handy and ready after this song, we will read um, chapter one of John's Gospel. And we're going to do it in a slightly different way, which I will leave you to see in just a minute. But we are going to sing and start with this song in the beginning.
In the beginning, the word already existed. Listen, come, let us worship. the grave. You free every captive. Break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom. Awaken to life. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. And break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken to life. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. You have done great things. You have done great things. Above it all, hallelujah, God, 
unshakable hallelujah you have done great things i hope you enjoyed that new way of reading the scriptures um what we're going to do now we're just going to have a, a time just responding to the scriptures and that song and what i'd like you to do is we're going to pray but we'll keep everybody muted but look come on let's not be slow in praising god unmute yourself and uh say your own prayers i'll start off and then mute yourself so that we can get a better recording lord i thought that 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 that, that film was wonderful about you i'm amazed what you've done that god became man and dwelt amongst us lived with us became as we are you are incredible you're worthy to be praised oh jesus your people here with millions around the world worship you our king and our god thank you so please feel free and mute yourself and just worship god thank you lord that your word is living and active thank you that you were the word you are the word you've always been you've always existed and you knew each person's days before even one of them came into being thank you for this opportunity to thank you and worship you together this morning thank you that you're a god full of truth and grace thank you thank you amen thank you god it's just amazing it's just that you came and dwelt among us you came and dwelt on the earth full of glory what an awesome thing just to just to meditate on that alone you came and dwelt Lord, it's just too wonderful to comprehend, but you did and do. Thank you, God, that that's such a, it's so important and it's as relevant today as it was in those ancient times. That Jesus, you're the same yesterday, today and forever. And I praise you and I thank you for that, Lord. Amen. Lord, I just want to thank you that. You will break the chains that bind us. But you alone, Lord, can set us free. And when you set us free, we are free indeed. Just before we come to, to Andy's preach, very much into this, but it's something we can do together. If you'd like to raise your hands with me. Or just a, a, a sign of worship to you. Throughout the Bible, it says, lift up holy hands, hands of praise and worship. And it's just so good, Lord, although we're distant in space, we're all over this Lincolnshire land. You can see that we're raising our hands together as people who believe in you, who love you and worship you. A simple sign, Lord, but an act of our worship. Thank you that you receive it and are blessed. Amen. Well, as you know, we are setting out on a wonderful journey into John's gospel. And as you've probably seen, I get I'm very <laughs> I'm incredibly excited every time I read this. I'm now going through the gospel about probably about the 25th time. And every single time I read it, every time I watch that film, wonderful new revelations come up to me so simple but so deep so i do encourage you no matter how difficult it may be or, or how precious your time is read the book of john again and again and again and i promise you that god through the holy spirit will bring revelation and revelation to your mind however you think about yourself he'll give you something for you and corporately he is building up again this picture that we have a portrait before us as a church of who <laughs> jesus is many of us uh, 
known Jesus many, many years, but I know profoundly that whether you've known him for a, a few weeks, a year, 40 years, he is wanting to reveal more of himself to us and to his church in these days. All right. So I can't wait uh, for Andy. Andy's going to do a two part sermon. And uh, this is quite, again, quite novel. So this is the first part. And I think he's out in Willingham Woods. But let's find out. This morning when I woke up, came downstairs, made me tea, opened the laptop and started thinking, praying on what I was going to say to you guys this morning. And I'm absolutely convinced that Father said to me, get outside, son. I want to share something with you. And I want you to share that with the brothers and sisters in the church. You recall last week we looked a little bit at the glory of God and I equated it with the white perfect light of God being shone through a prism, the prism of Jesus and then that light coming out in multitudes of colours and hues and textures. And as I prayed this morning before heading out here, and by the way, it's quite early in the morning and the ground's rock solid and frozen. Father said to me, go out and stand, I suppose metaphorically, on top of a mountain. So I'm stood here on top of a mountain. And look, first of all, to the south. And what do you see? What do you feel? I'm looking then to the south. And a gentle, warm breeze is blowing at me. It's not hot. It's just a gentle warming. The sort of warming that slowly defrosts and wells gradually inside me. I'm going to stretch my arms out and let that gentle warming warm and bring light and warmth and heat to me. I can feel it. I can definitely feel it. Now turn to the north. And there's an icy blast coming down from the north. Yet it's like an icy blast when you're hot and you're bothered, and you're sweaty, and you're anxious, and you're all head up. Oh man, it's like diving into a, the sea on a really hot day, or getting under a cool shower, or the ice in a really cold drink on a hot day. Tingles the senses, every single nerve end starts to feel alive and come alive and it cools oh man that is so good now the east and i think we can just about get it there we go there's a sunrise in the east the sun is rising after a dark night and a very cold one at that and that's bringing light as promised the light has come and as it starts to hit the top of the trees I can get that clarity becomes evident 
her light is coming, the light of the world, rising in the east. Now to the west. And it's a little early in the day, but imagine you're looking to the west at the end of a day as the sun sets and goes down. God's glory is there too. God displays his glory as much in our beginnings and sustaining us as he does when it's time to end. We've all seen and admired fantastic, beautiful sunsets and a time of great rejoicing and happiness too as we look out on them. And that, I believe, is what God's saying as well to us today. He will be glorified in our end as much as he'll be glorified in beginnings. Pray me if this bit jungled, I'm just literally saying what God's bringing to my heart. The next thing he says now is look up. Look up. Close your eyes. Stretch out your arms again. Put your head back and look up. Remember last time I talked about the light, the rainbow lights, the multitude of lights through a prism? Well, this time he's showing more. He's showing more. The lights are swirling, colours, texture, vibrancy. They're all moving and coalescing and swirling. Ah, about that. The glory of God in the heavens is being shown to us. In that light I hear music. Layer upon layer of melody, of bass, of beat. Yet I can hear each individual note with clarity. Just can't express it to a camera. But you get, you're getting there. It's such beautiful music rising and falling. And then the voices in it. Oh man, there's angelic voices too. Singing out God's praises. Imperceptible, not even words at times. From the deepest bass to the highest soprano, all in unison and unity. And they're saying, glory to God in the heavens. I'm reminded of the angels singing that at Christ's birth. Emmanuel, he's with us. The Lord has come. But like I said, I could still hear each individual note in amongst this, not cacophony, this rising and falling full orchestra, rock band, techno, keyboards, you name it, it's all in there. And it doesn't sound a mess, it actually sounds perfect. And then there's the smells. I'm trying to think, I have my favourite smells, but I'm not smelling that, I'm smelling life itself. And light, if you could smell light, this is what it would smell like. And it hits the senses again. And like so many smells and perfumes, it transports you to a place. You remember when certain smells take you to certain places? You remember of those perfect roast dinners, baby? See, taste and smell that the Lord is good. And the smell, it's like wafting over, like the Bisto advert. You catch it on your nostrils and you go there. And I'm following that smell. And before, so I approach that smell as that smell gets stronger and headier and more beautiful and more succulent and more gentle and everything. Before me is a table. And this table is laid out with such foods as you have never seen. It's a banquet lying out before. An invitation to dive in. But where do you start? Do you just take, do you gorge on it? You could. Or do you just take each little 
mouthful, each succulent, juicy mouthful of food. Pop it in. Oh man, the texture, the feel, the taste. Oh, it's so, so good. So good that you want more. You want more, yet you can fill yourself with it. You can fill yourself with it and be satisfied. The table stretches out further than I can see. It's laid out before me. And the invitation to come and eat and dine of this. And I've been talking for 10 minutes. I'm not finished yet. Oh dear Lord, what are you doing? Right. Here's the next bit. It's going to sound weird. I now see a funnel. It's a huge funnel. Massive great thing. And pouring into this funnel is all what I've been explaining, all what I've been saying. The sights, the sounds, the smell, the feel, the touch, the colour, the taste, the invigoration on you. Everything is being poured into this enormous funnel. And it's massive and wide and then it gets narrower and narrower and narrower and then we get a spout right at the end and it's pouring out of that spout nothing's missed the brim the the, the opening at the top of the funnel is so vast it just all goes in there and then it all pours out at the bottom and it's pouring out, well we know where it's pouring out, it's pouring out into a man. He originally started as a small baby, but all the glory of God, the mightiness of God, and his Holy Spirit is poured out in the person of Jesus Christ. I'm going to head back into uh, warmer places now and we'll pick up on that when I'm back at my desk in the office. Great. Now, we're going to, before he comes back, we'll allow him time to get home um, and we'll pick up that second part. But what I want you to do is let those pictures that Andy, that God was giving Andy just to think about as we just sing this song before Andy makes his way home and we hear him again, in Christ alone. the 
ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands Andy's made his way home. Andy, did he get home? Well, I'm back in again. Oh. Now, if it seems like I'm banging on a bit about the glory of God being revealed, I make absolutely no apology. As we go through the John's Gospel, it's critical that we get a handle on this right from the start. The glory of God becoming a man in Jesus. All God's majesty being funneled in. We go to verse 14 of the first chapter of John. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth full of grace and truth well that's an odd phrase one that well i think we knock it about at quite regular intervals it seems but what can we deduce from it this description of jesus character come with me to the old testament and in exodus 34 verses 5 and 6 God, sorry, Moses, <coughs> excuse me, had gone up Mount Sinai, Sinai, and God had met with him. And to quote, then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Well, you need to read from chapter 18, verse 7, right through to 34, 6 to get the full gist of it, really. And you'll find that this is the second time Moses had gone up a mountain to receive commandments and meet with God. First time, while he was away, the people had promptly forgotten all that God had done for them, knocked up an idol in the form of a golden calf, and parted like there's no tomorrow in drunken revelry. God pretty much decided enough was enough. Go back, he said to Moses, 
Leave me alone, that I may be destroy them, and will start again. Tough stuff. Moses appealed to God, and God relented, but not without serious consequences, though, as you will see if you read round that. God had every reason to wash his hands of the lot of them, but through grace and mercy, another chance was presented. That's not to say the power of God can be mocked or taken advantage of. Full of grace and mercy he may be, but just as well. This truth of grace and mercy leads us to a decision. Do you believe the truth of Jesus and what he came to do? Or not? There's no middle ground here. Either God has become man with all that, that entails, or he hasn't. We find in 10, verses 10 and 11 of John, word, John 1, such sadness in the words, failure to recognise, accept and be welcomed, even to his own people. Yet and again through this majestic grace and mercy, verse 12 offers such hope, such redemption, such riches and joy. When it says, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Belief or unbelief. Choose life or choose death. Choose the light or choose dark. That's the question this morning. John, the writer, now introduces his first witness. John the Baptist. Now, this could get confusing as we two Johns here, but bear with me, I'll try and distinguish between the two as we as we press on. John the Baptist was an odd character to say the least. If you remember in the run up to the Christmas story, how he'd been a miracle baby born from an old couple, way past the age of producing children, been prophesied over and set apart for God. Now we pick him up here, preaching in the desert, eating wild locusts and honey, wearing a camel's hair shirt, probably unkept hair, and a matted beard, hardly fitting the bill at all of what you'd expect to announce the coming Messiah. God certainly does have a sense of humour. Perhaps a bit of a crazy man, banging on about repentance, baptising people and announcing the weirdest of things. He'd certainly draw a crowd. Oh, you know, thousands went out to see him and he picked up a decent amount of followers as well. A real charismatic guy all round. Sort of bloke who today would attach a large following on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, etc. Getting hundreds and thousands of hits. Yet... We find him in humility and humbleness and a complete surety when asked who he was. People flocked out to see and hear him, maybe at some kind of freak show or entertaining day out, perhaps for a bit of a laugh or to ridicule, start an argument and mock this strange preacher man. Yet, perhaps once being in his company for a while, Something started to resonate. The penny began to drop, drop, to impact, to sink in, to reach inside to hearts and speak. Could this man, this oddball character, be telling the truth? Is the long-waited-for and longed-for Messiah coming? Or perhaps he's even here. Have the prophets of old come back to save us from the Romans? Bring us a new king and freedom? Word of John had got around so much that the religious leaders of the day sent out some of their minions. Note the head honchos didn't go themselves in verses 9 and 22 to investigate. They just sent some of the minor guys. Now, I really like this bit when they questioned John. He majored and emphasised not on who he was, but on who he was not. He made no bold claims about himself at all. Three times they asked him, Who are you? First of all they asked, Are you the Messiah? And he said, Nope, I'm not the Messiah. Messiah, sorry. 
We refer to Jesus Christ as the Messiah today. But back in first century Palestine, the word had different connotations. But the parallels still ring true now. The Jews hoped for a long Messiah. Sorry, the Jews long hoped, forgive me, for a Messiah would come. But as a conquering king, kick out the Romans, return Israel as an independent nation, a force and a power again, that God would restore them to the former glories. But they were looking at it from an earthly sense. We see plenty of messiahs come and go today in politics, business, commerce, careers, family, in the military, industry, advertising, sportsmen, musicians and celebrity, whatever that is. People are desperate to latch on to something to bring happiness, meaning and purpose. Yet it's all temporal, has no substance, quickly fades, and then we move on to the next thing. Or are you looking perhaps for some salvation and messiahship, for want of a word, in wishing for normal, a back the way it was, that could also be classed, to return back just as it was before, before this pandemic, before the upheaval, I just want it back the way it was. It'll be all right then. John, though, made it plain that it, whatever it was they were looking for in a Messiah, he was not it. So they asked him a second question. Are you Elijah? Strange question to ask. Are you Elijah, prophet from the Old Testament? We need to look back into the Old Testament prophecies to grasp this one. Remember, it was men educated in scripture asking the questions. These blokes knew their way around a scroll or two. And there's a lot to consider here in understanding the question. Firstly, according to 2 Kings chapter 2.11, Elijah didn't physically die, but was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. Great way to go, yeah. Also a great way to build a legend on the back of. Easy to come back when people believe you never actually died in the first place. And Elijah was most definitely a man full of the Spirit of God. So much so that his successor, Elisha's request, when asked by Elijah what he could do for him before he was taken, was to have a double portion of his spirit. In other words, I'll have some of what he's been on, please. In the book of Malachi, we read chapter 3, 1, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire, desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. And then again in chapter 4, and five, 4 verse 5 of Malachi, the prophet says, see, I will send the prophet Elijah to you. Before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes, he will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents, or, I, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Other similarities exist too. Both Elijah and John called the people to repentance. Both spoke out with power and authority against corrupt and sinful rulers. In John's case, this cost him his life. In physical appearance and demeanour, both wore camel hair coats, were, mm, let's just say, characters. Forthright, probably abrasive. Put a lot of noses out of joint, especially amongst the rulers and those who exercised and abused their positions of power. Quite plausible then to conclude that John was Elijah returned. But yet, in the foretelling of John's birth, recorded in Matthew chapter 117, we're told that John the Baptist will go on before the Lord in the spirit of Elijah. And what for? To turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So no. John is neither Messiah nor Elijah returned. 
Well, the third question they ask him is, are you the prophet then? Well, I sat there and I looked at that and thought, what prophet? I mean, there's been loads of them. Well, note the question. Not a prophet, but the prophet. In fact, it's not really a third question at all, but it's pretty much the first one repeated. And again, we need to go back into the Old Testament, this time to Deuteronomy chapter 18, where we find God is speaking to Moses, Moses delivering a promise that will go through from 18 through 19. It says there that I will, God is speaking, remember to Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites. And I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell you everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. Now, having done some studies around this passage, there's many interpretations of it. But I believe in this context we're referring to the prophet as Christ. It's in the fact that God is saying he will put his own words in the prophet's mouth and that he will be in complete obedience to God. Jesus, as a man, was in complete obedience to Father God in all things. John 5.19, when Jesus is questioned about his authority, replies, Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. The final sentence brings home the relationship between Father God and Jesus. It is Jesus, the Son of God, who comes to bring salvation and redemption, life and light, and it is God who judges. As Jesus said in John 12, 47, 49, If anyone hears my words, but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them on the last day. For I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his commands lead to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. So no, John is not the prophet. By this time, I think he's getting a bit fed up of them, as his answers get shorter and more blunt. In response to the last one, he just says no. Now, possibly in exasperation, they ask, well, just who are you then? We need an answer. What do you say about yourself? We could have something to take back. And John replies in the words of Isaiah, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. John the Baptist as witness to the coming Christ. A messenger, a signpost, pointing the way. It's not about him. It's about Jesus. And that should be our entire focus in all we think, say and do. To point the way towards Jesus. Less of us, more of him. Each and every day. Now Mike has consistently driven home the message, the need to be careful of how we listen. To conclude this morning, I'd like to add to that. Be careful not just how you listen, but of what and who we're listening to. Where are your influences coming from? Are they from messengers pointing directly to Christ? Or is the messenger promoting another narrative? Or are you even placing too much credence on an individual messenger, standing by the signpost, but not moving on? It's easy to do, easy to get sucked into a cult of personality. There are plenty of false prophets around. The internet's literally full of them. Plenty of leaders, preachers, teachers. 
who liked the sound of their own voice just a little bit too much. Plenty of wolves in sheep's clothing. Look to Jesus this morning, the way, the truth and the life. And be his image bearer, his ambassador, his servant in pointing the way. Follow the straight path that leads to Christ. Clear the road of obstacles, break down the barriers, level the mountains and bring up the low places. Make space that others may too see the signposts and travel with you on the road. As like last week and again today, please, if you'd like to discuss this more, be prayed for and share with us what the Lord is telling you. Stay after the service for a little while on Zoom or speak to Rona, Mike, myself, Jen and we'll love to help you along the road. Bless you all this morning. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. The very last... Uh phrase that Andy used was make space and it was very interesting that he had plenty of space in Willingham Woods and how God weaves uh, the word and prophetic word together. Just before we have communion together we're going to listen just a minute again it's one of these little minute sections that people are, are, are making for us to hear from Katie about making space. I think the Lord's been speaking to a number of us about moving into a wide open space, into more freedom in the spirit with him. And when our two older daughters left home, the youngest one knocked on the partition wall between her room and her sister's and discovered it was very flimsy and it could easily be knocked down and then she could have a bigger bedroom. So she persuaded us and we knocked it down and this wide open, much bigger space was revealed. It was quite miraculous, really. Suddenly within the house, without any other changes, um, there was this great big new room. And it was as though God was speaking to me about limits and partitions that I've placed on myself or other people have placed on me that limit the way I think. And that it was time to knock down some of those partitions and enter into a more wide open, spacious place with him. So I just want to encourage you really to ask the Lord to show you if there are ways that you think about yourself um, that limit what you are able to do, that limit your freedom, um, ways that aren't in line with the way he sees you, the way he thinks about you, so that you and all of us can become much freer to take hold of everything for which Christ has taken hold of us. Thanks, Katie. Um, I hope um, that's really blessed you. I'm going to hand over to uh, Steve and Helen. Uh, but before I do, I want to ask Steve and Helen, um, we're going to break bread together. If you can introduce breaking of bread just say what you've got to say when you finish don't take the bread and wine as yet we're going to have a song and take it in the song so when you've just finished your introductions about the bread and the wine just hand back to me and we'll take it on from there is that all okay uh, over to you steve and helen reading from corinthians for i pass on to you what i received from the lord himself on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. Christ's body was broken for us so that we could live and be with him forever. His blood was shed by his stripes, we're healed. 
and in the sacrifice that Jesus made, he provided a way for us to live forever with him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Breaking bread and drinking the wine is one of the greatest acts of worship that we can actually do. Now, what I'd like us to do is we're going to hear probably a new song to you. When the words come that say, grace and mercy found me, oh, the blood of Jesus is greater. Right, so when the song comes about after a minute and it says, grace and mercy found me, we will together break the bread and drink the wine. Now, it's a wonderful song. It moves me deeply. And I think it's again an anointed song. It is a time as we break bread and drink the wine to worship. <clears throat> so I'm going to stand up and I'm going to engage with this. And then when, when the song says grace and mercy found me, we will break bread and drink wine together. The song will continue and we will continue just to worship. Thank you, Richard. Lord, we just thank you for the for the things that you did on that cross. Lord, we thank you for the, the indignities you suffered, for the way in which you tried to tell the people of your your nation what what you were about, that you were the Son of God, and all the things that you the descriptions you gave of our our way of living and how we should change it to yours. And Lord, I just say thank you that in the days afterwards you rose again. And because of that, you are our example. Because of that, you freed us to follow in your footsteps with you as the example. And Lord, you freed us the, to be that when this earthly life, life is over, that we will share eternity with you in paradise. So Lord, we just praise you for that. And thank you for all the things you do for us each day. Amen. Amen. Well, we're coming to near the end of our, our service, but um, I just want to share, before we, we're gonna close by just saying the grace together in a minute. And then there will just be a time at the, the end if you want to stay on uh, for prayer. I was watching the great Reinhard Bonnke. Do you know him? Yeah, great evangelist. And he's German. And uh, one day he was uh, called by a television company to go on their network. So he, he went to the studio. And then to his surprise, um, as part of the debate, was a staunch atheist. And uh, they got into conversation and Reinhard Bonnke started by saying, there is power in the blood of Jesus. And uh, he kept on by, by saying this. And uh, um, the atheist said, Mr. Bonnke, I do not believe that there is power in the blood of Jesus. And let me tell you why. Just look around the, uh, the world at the moment. After 2,000 years, we're no better. Reinhard Bonnke turned to him and said, Mister, the blood of Jesus is like a bar of soap. You can have a bar of soap standing right next to you, and it'll do you no good. In fact, you can work in a soap factory, and it can do no good to you. You need to apply the soap all over. You need to embrace it and take it on. So it is with the blood of Jesus. And uh, the atheist turned to him and said, Mr. Monkey, I've never met anyone quite like you. I've met evangelists before, but you, I see, are a professional evangelist. And uh, uh, Bonke said, Mister, let me tell you something. I am not a professional 
evangelist. I am someone like millions of others who've applied the blood of Jesus and known its transforming and healing power. And uh, he came to the end of that uh, little debate and he walked out of the studio. And as he was walking out of the studio, he heard a voice, Mr. Bonkey. And he turned round and he saw the atheist. And, he, and the atheist said, Mr. Bonkey, will you pray for me? There is power. It's a very cliched word that we have as Christians. There is power in the blood of Jesus, but there is power, wonder working power in the blood of Jesus. And uh, before we, we, we conclude uh, today, I want us, I want to pray for you, pray for us all here. In every need that you have, every sickness, every sorrow, every pain, every anxiety, every worry, every situation, every failure. Let me tell you, there is power in the blood of Jesus that is applied into our lives. So this morning, as uh, Andy's been talking about us, and the whole John's Gospel is about belief. Fear not. It says in Mark 3, 36, only believe. It's believing in Jesus and the power of his blood. So let me pray for you and reach out in your need, in your desire, for yourself, for your friends, for your family, that the blood of Jesus in these days will be applied and will see its wonder-working miracle power, not only in our lives, but in society around. So let's reach out. Father, we thank you that you sent your son to die for us and that Jesus, you gave your body broken for us and that you shed your wonderful blood, that there is healing, that there is deliverance, that there is mighty working power in your blood. And now in the name of Jesus, over every one of you, as you by faith are looking to Jesus Christ and his blood, let it act upon your life right now where you have a need in your body, in your mind, in the name of Jesus Christ. Receive healing power right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you. Um, over the week, let me know that wonderful working power that's been applied to your life or somebody else's life, how it's outworked. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, John, and everyone that's been involved. It's been, a, I think, a, a great time. So if you'd like to unmute yourselves, we'll have the total chaos of saying the grace together. The, the best things that we, we do. And again, let's look at each other and pray and receive the grace of our Lord oh, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. And the love, the love of God, love of God and, the and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Be with us all. And the with all we love. In Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Right. God bless you all. Oh, we're going to have a few, I'm sure we've got a few notices afterwards. If you'd like specific prayer or you're making a move into Jesus, you want to say, I believe. And just stay on a little bit towards the end and we'd be absolutely delighted to be able to pray with you. So over to you, Rona. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, such a powerful thing, prayer. Mike, thank you for praying over us. And I sense the Holy Spirit was moving amongst us. As Micah said, you know, let us know. Stay on now or let us know in the week. And those two testimonies from John and um, Katie uh, were excellent. So if you've got something to share, keep those coming because it helps build us up.
But Richard, if you can put one or two notices up, please. Um, prayer is powerful. Prayer is talking to God, having a conversation with God, listening to God. And um, tomorrow evening, um, our prayer meeting uh, will be led by Jane. And if you can swiftly move on to the next slide, we're, you know, all of us can pray, but we're so thankful for Jane and Sheila and Christine um, working together as a team to provide prayer cover for the church and 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 of course we all join in with that but just so you know where to direct things um if you look particularly at the third person Sheila she, rather than directing emergency prayer requests or general re prayer requests to myself please from tomorrow um head towards Sheila of course you can pray on your own you can pray in your pastoral groups but it is good you know there's power in prayer and there's more power when we uh, we all pray or a, a, a part of us pray of course confidentialities are kept and sometimes it's perhaps just half a dozen people praying and sometimes it's maybe 20 and Christine um, will be uh, working on the monthly prayer pointers for us thank you for that Christine and, and Jane is going to head up the meeting as I said tomorrow keep going Richard thank you you're doing a brilliant job you have done all more number then don't we uh, mm. and yes uh, thank you the, the media team that's Andrea yeah. Richard and myself have been yeah. working together on various aspects of, of media yeah. uh, the new website will go live tomorrow it, 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 it's a work in progress um, but any any comments and so on, please direct your friends to it yeah keep going Richard thank you I won't talk too much about that Thursday evening is together for purpose another zoom meeting and I know we sometimes feel we're a bit zoomed out but God moves amongst us when we meet we're not to give give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing and but we know not everyone can be there so we'll try and communicate key things with you so that's Thursday evening and keep going yes we're really excited about online alpha alpha as most of you will know is a is a course that uh, started at htb in london and many people have come to faith through it so start praying about that thinking about who you can invite it'll be an online course this time it's very good as well if you've not been a Christian long, if you're a new Christian, it will help get you grounded and make give you space to have conversations about the questions that you have. So Mike and Jen will be hosting that with one or two others, um, but that's starting towards the end of this month. So there'll be, there'll be various ways that you can publicize it. We'll have some invitation cards as well as yeah, thank you for people that do share our posts online. That really helps get the word out. So thanks. For that. Are there any more, Rich? Oh, next week we're continuing with the book of John. So um, let's get ourselves really absorbed and ready um, for how God is going to speak to us next week through Paul. Have a good week, everybody. So, yeah, thanks very much, Richard. Well, great. Good to see everybody. Um, have a great week um, and if you want to just stay on afterwards for a little while and like some particular prayer or just ministry that would be great to, to do we'll be here so God bless thanks Mike thanks everyone Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you be gracious to you.